Most guides I've seen get dockerizing Yang go wrong. I'm going to show you the right way to do it. I think the others go wrong in three main ways, so let me know if you faced any of these issues. The first is they use the run server command from Yango. This isn't meant to be used in production, you're going to lose out on a lot of performance. To solve this, we'll be using Green Unicorn. I'll explain a bit more when we're there, but essentially it's going to handle the traffic much better. The second problem I often see is the guides completely ignore how you can serve your static files, often leaving you with a broken end product as your CSS isn't loading in. We're going to be fixing this via Nginx. And finally, a lot of the guides ignore Yango admin, and it doesn't work most of the time with things like your CSS not loading. Overall, we're going to get an awesome production-ready Yango deployment that just works. Let's get into it. The project I'm going to be deploying is this simple Yango poll site. This also relies on a database, so we're also going to be deploying one of those as well. I'm going to be using Postgres, but don't worry, this should work with pretty much any of them, whether it's MySQL or SQLite. As you can see, very simple application. It's going to ask you a question like, have you subscribed? And when you've hit that subscribe button, you can come in here and you can click yes, and we can see the result of that poll. Over in my project files then, there are a few prerequisites that we need before we can get started with the doc file. The first one is we need a requirements.txt. Don't worry if you don't have one already, you can simply get one by running pip freeze and then outputting that to the requirements file. Once you do have one though, we're going to want to add the green unicorn package. The package name is gunicorn and the latest version is 23. So you can simply add this line to that file. This is going to allow us to use this in our Docker image later. After this, we need to make sure we have a few things in our settings.py. The first one is we need to make sure that we're using environment variables. So where I have things like debug, secret key, and allowed hosts, I'm using os.getemv, then the environment variable name, and then I also pass through a fallback value as well, just in case. Now you can get this by importing os at the top of the file here. Another cool tip for local development is to use python.env, and then you can simply say with these two lines, load.env, and then the env file you want to load for local development. This won't impact the Docker container. The way I like to set up my environment variables is to have a .env.local and then a .env.prod, and that's what we're doing in this tutorial. The values you're going to need in your settings.py are going to be the secret key, we're going to need debug, allowed hosts, and then CSRF trusted origins. Now you may already have some of these, but if you don't, you can simply go ahead and add it. Once you have, just make sure that you have those values in your environment variables as well. So in .env.local, I set debug to true since we're with local development. I set the allowed host to localhost and then the CRF trusted origins to localhost 8000. The only thing that changes in prod is we set debug to false for security purposes. And then we also change the trusted origins to 8001. And you'll see why later when we set up Nginx. Once you've done that, as you can see, I'm also setting up my database with the environment variables as well. I'm using the Postgres engine here, but this should work with pretty much any database that works with Django. Once you've got that, we need to go to our settings.py and we also need to make sure that our database is also using the environment variables as well. And again, you can do that using the os.getemv. After that, there's just two more things that we need to make sure are in our settings.py, and that's to make static files work. We need these two options here. Now, you may already have the static URL, but the static root one you might have to add. The static root is essentially telling Django where we want to collect our static files to when we run the collect static command later that's going to allow us to host our static files using Nginx. With that done then, the next thing we're going to want to do is create an entry point script. Now, the way I do it is I have an entry point .prod .sh script at the root level of my project files. And then inside of here, I run any command that I want to run when the container starts up. So it's good for things like database migrations. But the two that are absolutely crucial to our setup to make sure that static files work is going to be this collect static command here. As I mentioned earlier, this is going to get all of your static files and put them in that static files folder that we set up, and then we'll host them with Nginx. And then you can also do the migration great as well to get it working with your databases and make sure that everything is set up for you. Once you've put in here all of the commands that you want to run before the actual web server starts, that's when we need to then start it with green unicorn. That's going to be this line here and just make sure that it's last in this script. As you can see, we're starting with green unicorn, then we bind it to port 8000, which we'll be using in our Docker Compose later. We set it up with three workers, which is a nice default number. And then finally, this is the bit that you'll probably want to customize, the bit that says my site.wsgi and then colon application. You need to make sure that this lines up with your application name, so where I have the folder my site. And you'll know you're in the right place because you'll also have this wsgi.py file. Now it's probably going to be colon application, but you can double check by just going into this file. As you can see, it says it exposes the WSGI callable variable named application. And then we have the variable set down here as application as well. So with that line added, we're ready to go ahead and create our Docker file. 
To get started with Docker then, at the top level of our project, we're going to set up a Docker ignore first. This is going to tell Docker which files it doesn't need to carry over to our image as they're not going to be needed for actually building the dependencies and running the app. This can really help you cut down on the image size, speed up your builds, but it's most important for security. The one thing I want you to add to your Docker ignore above anything else is your .env files. So if I scroll down a bit here, you can see I've added in .env and then .env asterisk just to make sure all of them are being caught and not being copied over to that image as we could potentially leak sensitive information that way. The other things in this file just came from a template, so feel free to copy mine from GitHub. But as I said, it's just essentially ignoring things that we use in local development that we don't need in our image or container. With that done then, we're ready to go ahead and create our Docker file. So again, at the top level, the same place we put the Docker ignore, go ahead and create a Docker file. Now I've pasted in the final Docker file that we're going to be using here, but don't worry, let me go ahead and explain it block by block. We're actually using a multi-stage build here, so this is all considered stage one, the builder stage. What we're doing here is we're just using the Python image and we're using 3.13 slim, just making sure it's a small image to reduce that image size. Next, we're just doing some organization. We're creating the app directory and then we're setting it as our working directory. Then we go ahead and set some environment variables to actually optimize Python. Now this first environment variable actually just tells Python not to create some cache files that it usually creates, but they're not useful for containers. So we can go ahead and turn that off. And then the second one just tells Python to go ahead and write to the log files instantly and not hold them back in a buffer, which is crucial when we're trying to debug our containers. After that, we're gonna go ahead and install our dependencies. First, we just run the usual pip install upgrade, and then we go ahead and copy over our requirements.txt into that app folder that we created. Now, it's crucial here to only copy over your requirements.txt, not the rest of your application yet. After that, we go ahead and we run pip install on that requirements.txt. Now, the reason I said it is crucial to copy over the requirements.txt first is so we can take advantage of Docker layer caching. This is one of the tips you'll find in our video, Docker image best practices, be sure to check that out. But essentially it means that when Docker builds this the first time, it will install all of the requirements. But then on the second build, if the requirements.txt file has not changed, it's not gonna go ahead and reinstall them. It will just use its previous cache. Now, if we copied over everything, if we made any changes to our code, since we copied over everything, it wouldn't be able to know that the requirements.txt didn't change, and then it would just reinstall the dependencies. So this really helps to reduce that build time. Once we've installed our dependencies, we're going to move on to the production stage by saying from, and then we use Python 3.13-slim again. Now, if you're wondering why we do this in two stages, it's again to go ahead and reduce that image size and also has some security benefits as well. Essentially, when we installed those dependencies in that build stage, it would have come with a load of build tools and compilers, and then it would have produced the compiled code. What we're gonna be doing in the production stage is just copying over the compiled code, leaving behind all of those build tools that are gonna increase the image size and also potentially have security vulnerabilities that we don't want in our final application. After we create our new stage then, we're also going to go ahead and create a new non-root user. This is a great security practice just to make sure that your container isn't running with a root user, which again, could be another security issue. After we've done that, we're also going to make the slash app directory in this new stage. And then we're also going to give ownership of that directory to the app user as well. After that, we're gonna then copy over those compiled dependencies that I mentioned earlier into this new stage. We're just taking those compiled dependencies, none of the build tools. To do that, we're simply gonna say copy dash dash from builder, and then you're gonna to wanna to use these file paths here. After that, we're then gonna set the working directory to slash app again, since it's a new stage. We're then going to copy over all of our project files. So that's just using this dot dot syntax here. It's gonna copy everything except for what's in that dot docker ignore. And we also want to make sure that we're setting the owner of those files to that new app user that we created up here. After that, we also need to set the environment variables that optimized Python again, since it's a new stage. And then we can finally switch over to the non-root user, which is going to go ahead and run our commands to make sure that that container is running without root privileges. Finally, we go ahead and we expose the port that we mentioned earlier. So that's going to be port 8000, the one that we set up with green unicorn. And then after that, we need to make the entry point script we created executable. And then we need to set it as the startup command for the actual container. So that is everything that we need in our Docker file. So let's test out if this is actually building. To do that, we can run this docker build command from the top level of our project. Now you can change dash t here, it's the tag, to essentially anything you want to represent what the image name will be. Once we've done that, let's just hit enter and see if this works. There we go, I've already previously done this, so it's using the build cache there, and you can see it's super fast. Now that we have that though, we need to piece everything together using our docker compose to make sure that we're using nginx for the static files, and that we've also got a database up and running as well.
To do that, go ahead and create a docker-compose.yml file next to the docker file that we just created. In here, we're going to be defining three services, our database, our application, and then Nginx. Let's start out with the database. Very simple setup. As I said, I'm using Postgres, but this should work with any database setup that you have. I just use the very simple Docker Compose for Postgres. The only thing I do a little bit differently is I make sure all of my environment variables are actually loaded from the environment variable file using .env.prod. And then in here, you can see my Postgres settings down here. The one thing I will note as well, when you're using your production, you're going to be pointing the actual database host at the container name or the service name. So where I have DB here, that matches what I have in my Docker Compose. This is because we're not actually going to be using localhost. We're going to be taking advantage of Docker networking. After that, we can then go ahead and set up our actual application. So you can call this whatever you want, but what you want to do on the build step is simply just use a dot. This is going to go ahead and pick up the Docker file that we just created. And that means that if the image doesn't exist, it will build it for us as well. Again, you can rename the container here to whatever you want. And then we say depends on here to make sure that this only runs once the database is set up and working. After that, this part is the most crucial part for actually getting static files to work. We need to make sure we create a volume called static and we mount that to slash app slash static files. If you remember earlier, this static files path is what we set in the settings.py and it's where all of our files are going when we run that collect static command. After that, the same thing we did above, we just set the environment variable file to .env.prod. Lastly, this is where we need to go ahead and use nginx. So in this setup, Nginx is going to be handling the static file serving, and then it's going to forward all of the dynamic requests to the actual Django application that's been set up with Green Unicorn. The one thing we need to do, though, is create our Nginx config. Again, I'm going to place this at the top level of my project. So just create a file called nginx.conf like this. And then inside of here, you're going to configure it like so. Now I'm going to skip over the standard Nginx stuff, but the parts I want to point out specifically are in this HTTP server config. You want to make sure you have include MIME types and that default type of application slash octet stream. This is the part that makes Django admin CSS work. If you don't have this, you'll notice there's no CSS and it's impossible to use that admin portal. Next, we also need to make sure that we have that static files path working so that it's actually serving them up. All you have to do is say location slash static, and that's an alias for the slash static directory, as that's the volume we're going to be mounting in a bit. Then you can also set a cache time if you want as well. Finally, we need to handle all other requests. For that, you can simply say proxy pass. And remember, this has to be the service name that you just set up in your Docker Compose to so make sure it matches and also matches the port that we use there as well. And then finally, you also need to make sure that you're passing those important headers to Django so they can handle the requests properly. Once we have that, we can head back to our Docker Compose and make sure that it's using that new Nginx config. To do that, all you have to do is just mount it as a volume and then point it to this path here. After that, you also need to make sure that you're mounting the static volume so we can go ahead and see those static files that we pulled out of the Django web service. Afterwards, we can just say depends on Django web to make sure that that service started up first. And then finally, we just have volumes for Postgres data. That's just a Postgres thing to make sure that volume is saved. Now, the only other thing to take care of is that this port here of 8001 to 80 matches up with what you put as your trusted origins here after the local host. This will make sure that all of the requests will be able to get through without hitting any issues. With that done, we can finally start up our Docker Compose and see if our application is working. So all you need to do is run Docker Compose up at that top level, hit enter, and you should see a load of logs and there shouldn't be any errors in there. Everything looks good to me in here. It started up that Nginx proxy, it started up my database, and then it's also started up my Django Docker application. One thing to point out is in the Django Docker logs, it says it's listening at and then has that port of 8000. Remember, you want to be going to localhost 8001, the port that you set on Nginx instead. So let's check out if it worked. There we go. Over on localhost 8001, my application is up and running and it appears that I can vote correctly. So everything, including that database, is working there. The CSS is loaded in. Finally, let's just check the admin portal. And there we go, over at localhost 8001 slash admin, the Django admin panel has loaded up and the CSS is working so I can actually use it. I hope this helped you out. As I mentioned at the start, I wanted to improve upon those issues I found in other setups. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments down below. And if it did help, leave a like, subscribe, and as always, see you in the next one.